The major epidemic of SARS-CoV-2, also known as COVID-19, continues to ravage the world. In this video, I hope to give you a background on the virus. The hope is with accurate information, you can make good decisions for you and your family. This video covers the origins of the virus, the viral structure, its replication, symptoms of the disease, and finally treatments. Let's begin. There is significant controversy about whether animals in the seafood market in Wuhan, China were the source of this epidemic, or whether a person ill with the virus went to the market and increased its spread. The first case was diagnosed on December 1st in China and had no parent link to the market. There were another 13 out of the initial 41 cases that could not be linked to the market. So it really seems like this virus jumped to somebody who then went to this market where there are a lot of people and then it spread from there. In just a few months, the virus has since spread around the world. SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus with a positive single-stranded RNA genome. The membrane is decorated with a number of proteins, with the spike glycoprotein probably being the most important for immunity. The prominent spike proteins give the virus the appearance of a solar corona, hence the name of this virus family. This virus family has been around for years, but most of the time they just cause simple colds. It's only in the last decade or so that we've started to get these severe lower respiratory infections and SARS-CoV-2 is the first one that's caused a global pandemic. The SARS-CoV-2 genome is 30,000 base pairs long and it is an RNA virus and this is very large for an RNA virus. The first two genes, ORF1A and ORF1B, encode the polyproteins which make parts of the replicase. The large RNA replicase is unusual in that it encodes a 3' exonuclease, which is a proofreading activity. So when it copies its genome, it is actually able to go back and fix mistakes. This is probably necessary because of the large genome. If it didn't have that proofreading capability, you'd never make a successful copy of the virus. This also means that this RNA virus does not mutate as rapidly as other RNA viruses. The spike E and M proteins may serve as targets for the immune response. SARS-CoV-2 replication. SARS-CoV-2 inner cells by attaching to the ACE2, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. These receptors are common on epithelial cells that line the lung, heart, kidney, brain, and gut, thus accounting for the targets of the virus. Once the SARS-CoV-2 binds, the virus is taken into the cell by the endocytotic pathway. Entry of the virus into the cytoplasm is dependent upon acidification of the endosome, which involves the spike protein cleavage and a conformational change. A membrane fusion between the viral envelope and the endosome occurs, and the nucleocapsid then enters the cytoplasm. After entry of the single-stranded RNA into the cytoplasm, it heads to the ribosome. The viral genome has a 5' cap and a poly A tail, so it looks like a messenger RNA. Because of this, it is recognized by the ribosome and translated into a large polyprotein. The polyprotein is degraded by viral proteases into the replication enzyme and other non-structural proteins, or NSPs. The replicase makes subgenomic and genomic RNA. The subgenomic RNA serves as mRNAs for various other proteins. The structural proteins are translated at the endoplasmic reticulum and are glycolated at the Golgi apparatus. What that means is these proteins that are translated this way E, M, and S go through this normal export pathway in the cell. They then have sugars that decorate them, put on by the Golgi apparatus, and they end up in a membrane. Full-length RNA, nucleocapsid protein, then bind to vesicles containing viral envelope proteins, N, M, and E, facilitate this interaction. The fully formed virion then exits the cell by exocytosis. So that's the replication cycle. 
is pretty typical for an RNA virus, except again, one of the notable things about this virus is it has this large genome and then it has a replicase that proofreads. Symptoms of illness appear two to 14 days after exposure. An early warning sign is a loss of smell. Sufferers can experience fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, and body aches. The illness typically runs its course in two weeks, but infected individuals can shun the virus for up to 22 days. A serious trait of this disease is the occurrence of asymptomatic carriers, which make up 25% of patients. At least that's what the latest research is showing. It's not yet clear how many of these eventually go on to show symptoms and how many just recover and never know they had the disease. The majority of cases of SARS-CoV-2 are mild, with 80% never progressing to severe illness. In severe cases, pre-existing conditions decrease survival. The CDC examined data from reports of 2,449 patients. Of these, 508 required hospitalization, and the outcomes in these patients appear in the chart. Note that the rate of hospitalization is significant for all age groups above 20 you can see that there were a number of hospitalizations and they were found in everyone in the age groups. You also see that deaths though were lower in the younger age groups and increased over time. One thing to note about this is it doesn't seem to be age so much as the accumulation of pre-existing conditions. And you can see what the death rates are for the various conditions that were talked about, heart disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, etc. However, even if you don't have any pre-existing conditions, your risks of death after infection are 0.9%. Investigations into SARS-CoV-2 treatment continues. At this point, no drug has shown spectacular success against SARS-CoV-2. There are three categories that I'm going to discuss that are active areas of research to try to inhibit the virus. Endosome fusion, protease inhibitors, and RNA-dependent replicase inhibitors. Endosome fusion requires acidification of the endosome to enable the S-protein cleavage and then entry of the virus into the cytoplasm. Drugs that inhibit acidification, such as chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, have found success in blocking the virus in vitro. However, results of clinical trials show that hydroxychloroquine is not effective in stopping this virus. Umifenorinvin is another drug that's under investigation, but the trials are not finished. Protease inhibitors, such as lopanavir, that was developed for HIV, another RNA virus, along with ritonavir, have been tried without much success. Interferon B, which has also been shown to be clinically effective against other coronaviruses, was tested, and again, it's not been effective against SARS-CoV-2. Finally, RNA replicase inhibitors such as remdesivir, originally developed as a treatment for Ebola, in early studies, remdesivir had shown some, but not spectacular success. The time to recovery was 11 days instead of 15 in this control group, and a mortality rate of 8% in the test group, and 11% in the control group was found. It seems to help in some trials, but a recent large WHO trial showed no significant benefit to remdesivir and no significant benefit to any of these other drugs. SARS-CoV-2 should be a good vaccine target, and it turned out it was a good vaccine target. It has this S protein covering its surface and that's easily identified by the immune system. Three vaccines have emergency authorization for use in the US, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are both mRNA vaccines. In these cases, an RNA, in these cases, an RNA that encodes a viral protein is injected into patients. The protein is translated at the ribosome and produces the viral protein. This then elicits an immune response. 
Viral vector vaccines based upon proteins or parts of proteins of the virus, often the spike protein, that are then displayed in another type of virus have also been developed. The AstraZeneca vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine are these type of viruses and both have also been shown to be effective. A potential advantage though of the RNA-DNA vaccines is the ability to quickly ramp up production and create enough doses to protect the general public. It should be possible to also alter the formulas, uh, formula of these vaccines relatively quickly. The mRNA vaccines from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna are spectacularly effective. The Pfizer, BioNTech vaccine showed a 95% efficacy in their combined phase two, three trials of over 40,000 participants. They reported only 100, uh, they reported 170 infections with all but eight of them in the control group. There were 10 severe cases and all but one of them was in the control group. Subsequent use of these vaccines in the United States and other places around the world has shown them to be incredibly protective, not only of the original SARS-CoV-2 virus, but of all the variants, including the recent Delta variant that has emerged. The Moderna vaccine was just as effective. In their 30,000 patient cohort, 95 cases were reported, 90 in the control group and only five in the test group. All severe cases of COVID-19 were in the control group. The low incidence of severe cases is also a great sign, indicating not only does the vaccine protect against the disease, if you get sick, you are far less likely to get severe illness. The AstraZeneca vaccine is also just as effective with only one dosing protocol giving 90% efficacy. The vaccine has an advantage of being able to be stored at refrigeration temperatures. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine was shown to be 85% effective at preventing severe diseases. In all cases with these vaccines, they give greater than 99% protection against dying from COVID-19. How willing is the world to be vaccinated? The vaccine is now readily available in the United States, yet a significant percentage of individuals are unwilling to be vaccinated. So what can you do? The most important thing you can do to help society and yourself in general is get vaccinated. Vaccines are readily available in the US. If we get vaccinated, we can put COVID-19 behind us. If we don't, areas that have too low vaccination rates are going to suffer. A great illustration of this is to compare two counties in the US, Dane County, Wisconsin, where vaccination rates are 81%, and Nassau County, Florida, where vaccination rates are 51%. Compare the two graphs. First, I do wanna point out that Florida is doing a terrible job of tracking this virus, only reporting cases every week now instead of more frequently as seen in Dane County. Even with this poor data collection, NASA is clearly in serious trouble with 24 times the case rate of Dane County. People are going to needlessly die because of a refusal of the population to get vaccinated. In any case, keeping your immune system healthy is a great idea. There are a number of behaviors that have been shown to keep your immune system in peak condition. Get enough sleep, eat well-balanced diets with fruit and veggies, don't smoke, drink moderately if at all, and try to minimize stress. Yeah, I know, it's kind of crazy to try and minimize stress. The other thing that you can do is fight misinformation. I now charge you with this task. You more, know more than 95% of the U.S. population about this disease. Use your knowledge to inform others and fight back strongly against misinformation. You don't have to be rude, but don't let incorrect from information go unchallenged. One of the best ways to challenge information is to ask questions. Ask them where the source of their information is. Ask them if that's a reliable source. Regardless, please get vaccinated and hopefully we will be able to put this illness behind us.